If you had the power to come back from the dead, what would you do? The government wants to capture and experiment on you forever. And now everyone else, including your parents, either wants to help them or kill you for bounty. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the black ghosts in a gin. This kid doesn't know this, but he's about to die a brutal death. K here is a normal kid living his boring life, when on this particular day something seems off. In class, they learn about a Jin, a group of supernatural beings thought to be immortal. This group was discovered 17 years ago in Africa, and since then have been hunted by the government, with massive bounties being placed on them all over the world. However, the teacher says that any one of them could be an Ajin, as no one knows until they die and come back to life. Later on, K heads home, but is in his own head just as he crosses the street. Then suddenly, a huge truck hits him, running over, crushing his body, and killing K in the process. His lifeless corpse just lays there in the middle of the street. But this is only the beginning. The crowd suddenly gathers near the crashed truck when something insane happens. K wakes up covered in his own blood, good as new, as his body emits a mysterious black smoke, and he begins to freak out. He's an Ajin, and now the world is coming for him. Okay, okay, let's not panic, but we need to get our heads in the game here. Even if we could trust our friends, which we can't, they wouldn't be able to help us as they are kids after all. And like what we learned from our teacher. There's a massive bounty placed on our heads, which means we can't trust anyone we know. Our own home isn't safe anymore, and so I would first head to an ATM away from the crime scene and take out as much cash as I could. And I'll also get a new change of clothes because I'm bloody as all hell. The next thing that I would do is head to a convenience store and get some food that will last us a few days. Hear me out now. It's safe to say that the first few hours after the accident is when we'll have the best chance to not be spotted, as the news works to catch up with the current events, meaning we don't have to worry about cops yet, and that also means that we should have a little bit of time before our own face is plastered all over the news. We're going to have to be content with giving up our friends and family, at least for the foreseeable future, especially if being in a gin is considered to be as insane as people make it out to be, and we can't go anywhere where the cops would think to look for us. The first thing we need to do is to get out of this highly populated area. Japan is a land of forests and mountains, with some 25 million hectares covering 67% of the country. This means that I'm going to make my way out of town to a heavily forested area to use as cover as I plan my next few moves. K is freaking out, and there's a bounty on a Jin's, which means he can't even trust his own friends. He runs off quickly before the ambulance and police arrive. He thinks his life is over, but actually it's just starting, and it's about to get a whole lot worse. K runs into the forest and is terrified. He notices flashing lights in the distance where his house is. The cop have already showed up at his home, which means nowhere is safe. He decides to call a childhood friend, Kaito, who we see is already packing a get-out-of-town bag. How convenient. Just then, a policeman spots him and he makes a run for it. He can't trust anyone, not even the law itself. K rushes through the trees and bushes until he trips and injures himself. The police is almost on him. Suddenly, Kaito jumps out of nowhere and knocks the policeman out as the two run towards Kaito's bike. Kaito has a plan for them to head up north to a faraway village, but what he doesn't know is that they'll never get there. Meanwhile, this mysterious white-haired guy here shows up at the police setup near Kay's house. He's from the Ministry of Health and is an Ajin hunter expert. He tells the cops how to really catch Ajins using tranquilizer guns as he prepares them for the deadly hunt that will now span all over Japan. He also sends his assistant to go check and see if Kay's sister, who is recovering in the hospital, knows anything, but this will cost him and his assistant a lot more than they they think. Back on the run, K and Kaito are filling up on gas as they notice a van coming. They quickly rush off, but it's too late. The two men in the car recognize K's face as his identity is now all over the news. The boys eventually stop again as K needs to go to the bathroom, but just as K waddles off behind the bushes to go pee, he's attacked by the men following them in the van. My oh my, two young kids not thinking things through, how original. K and Kaito are acting too carefree about this situation. And are acting like freaking idiots. K has an end with Kaito, as he is not wanted or affiliated with Kaito in any significant way, at least on paper as of yet. This means that Kaito could have gone places without drawing attention. This also means that Kaito should have dropped K off a few feet before or after the gas station, and should have filled up the bike alone, with K waiting in the bushes nearby or something. Even if there was no passing cars at that time, Japan is a country with around the same amount of CCTV cameras installed as the United 
United Kingdom, with around 6 million cameras nationwide. These kids were just asking to be caught. And while we're at it, if I was escorting a friend across the country and he was a super mutant, I would at least start googling what it means to be in a gin. This way we could have just let Kay die without helping him, knowing that either his ghost or Kay himself would come back from the dead to kill those guys. And if what we read online was wrong, eh, then Kay died, sucks to be him, we could have gone back home anyways. Problem solved. The two men violently beat up Kay, and Kaito tries to stop them. One of them accidentally kills Kay by choking him, but that's when Kay sees the most horrifying thing, a black ghost. As his mind wanders outside of his body for a second, as he finally wakes up, and this time pissed off. Kay emits a loud, piercing scream that paralyzes everyone, including Kaito, for a second. Kay yells at Kaito to get moving, giving Kaito the shock that he needed to shake it off, giving the boys enough time to escape as Kay tries to figure out what the hell that terrifying black ghost was. Back in the van, the two men catch up again near Kay, just as they are stopped and paralyzed on the train tracks by something. And that's when one of them looks up and sees a dark black sinister figure echoing Kay's words from its faceless mouth. The man screams in horror as the train kills them. But these two boys can't catch a break as they moments later pass a man on a motorbike who spots Kay's face. And that's when the chase is on. Hold on, hold on. Seriously? You're a wanted fugitive and you couldn't even afford to wear a scarf over your face or a mask? The whole country is looking for you. Like, what are you doing? Kay should have been a greedy bastard like us and swapped for the better, more face covering helmet with Kaito. This was an easy fix. Motorbike man forces them off the road as Kay and Kaito crash, seemingly killing Kaito and badly injuring Kay. Motorbike man comes near Kay and is about to kill him. Kaito then gets up. He's alive and pissed as all hell and beats the shit out of motorbike guy with a rock. Unfortunately for Kay, he can't move due to his leg being broken. Kay wakes up seconds later, reset and good as new. The two boys then stop over at Kaito's safe house to fill up on equipment for the long journey ahead. Kay and Kaito then discuss plans for the next step of this escape plan, as Kay wants to just live in peace. So Kaito suggests that his village again is a possible option, as he claims it's a place where no one would care if he wasn't a djinn. Kaito then lets Kay rest as he goes off to the nearby store to get some supplies. Kay knows what Kaito doesn't, that this journey is too dangerous for a human, and one that will cost a lot of lives. Elsewhere, the assistant of white-haired man shows up at the hospital to see if Kay's sister knows more about Kay and a djinn's than what she already told the cops. And this is when Kay's sister mentions the scariest thing ever. She claims that when she and Kay were kids, their pet suddenly died. And that's when Kay mentioned that there was this faceless black ghost hovering over their bodies. But she personally couldn't see anything there herself. This stuns the assistant, and her face gives off more than she realizes. But just then, her body contorts violently up in the air as she gets stabbed by something, and then her chest bursts open with blood. It's a black ghost, and only she can see it. Kay's sister screams in horror as the assistant's lifeless corpse thumps back down to the floor. The invisible monster then ends up killing and ripping everyone apart in the room as the sister can only watch in terrifying fear. She can't see what we can, that there's an insanely huge and blood-curdling monster in the room with her, and that's when the assistant comes back to life. Turns out she's an Ajin too. Shit's about to go down, but the only thing we have on our side is the fact that other people are in this shit show with us. My thinking is to fight fire with fire and set this one out until everything goes to shit. So what if we brought some more people into this room to add as a further distraction? Hospitals usually have a button or a switch nearby on the patient's beds to alert the nurses when patients are in need of something. So I would have pressed that button and told them that I was in need of assistance and dashed out of that window and waited and watched as more unsuspecting nurses would have come in. This would no doubt cause a bloodbath to occur resulting in many deaths. Then as this shit show went down, I would have either waited until whatever was going on was over or I would have worked on finding a way down or at least away from this main room. Cause let's be honest, what else could we have done aside from stirring up more shit? And we love stirring up shit. The assistant fights this black ghost with her very own and they fight each other to the death, tearing each other's limbs apart and knocking each other around until the assistant's black ghost kills the other one, striking it with blunt force trauma to the head. And we see the fallen black ghost being controlled by Mr. Douchebag right outside. But this all turns out to be just a distraction, as now Kay's sister has been taken by the infamous Ajin called Sato, or the man in the hat. Secured in an unknown location later, Sato asks Kay's sister all about Kay, and she spills everything there is to know about her brother, until Sato knocks her out. Then, back at the safe house, Kay forms his own game plan, using what he 
already knows about Japan's statistics. According to the Ministry of Labor, if over 1 million people in Japan die every year, that means two people die every minute, which means some of them must be a jinn. K leaves the safe house as Kaito remains sleeping unaware. K doesn't have much time until he is discovered, so he needs to act fast, deciding that he'll find the rest of the jinns in hiding through the internet. He sets off. Okay, I am just going to comment on how unbelievably stupid this is. You have a friend willing to help you, yet you're too high and mighty and noble to let him in on your adventure? You're a kid with no money, food, or supplies. Kaito has a safe house, a village, and even a bike. Remember, he even packed a duffel bag from earlier. He's way more prepared than Kay is. This is why I wouldn't ditch him at all. In fact, his plan sounds solid enough, aside from the fact that they may be rushing to Kaito's village at a time when roadblocks and alerts for Kay's whereabouts will be at their highest. And Kaito hasn't even been discovered yet, so we could still use him to continuously supply us with food and water when we run out, as we wait for the heat to die down on us. But even then, I would consider avoiding heading to Kaito's village entirely. The government, in reality, is more than equipped to find us. I instead would work on finding some other way to find more hidden agents throughout the country, as they are obviously better than we are at hiding themselves, such as by searching the online forums through a VPN, like the sponsor of today's video. I'm kidding, calm down. But I would consider going through the dark web through an Onion browser to discover other agents out there. An Onion browser is simply a worldwide network of servers that will pass our data through different servers, giving us better levels of internet privacy and freedom. Now that we are one of them, finding other agents should be our main objectives before anything else. K then gets a phone call from his sister's phone number, but the person on the other line is the man in the hat who says he has his sister and that if he wants to find out why they have her phone, he needs to come and meet him now. K then dashes off as he takes Kaito's bike, driving it for hours until it finally runs out of gas. But he doesn't let this stop him as he continues the journey on foot. Hours later, K walks tired and dehydrated as he wonders if he'll die from dehydration and that's when he finally reaches the meetup point. This meeting is going to cost him his life more times than he will ever want to know. Here sits the famous Ajin Sato and his second minion in command, Mr. Douchebag, who Sato helped break out of a government lab earlier. Sato is a man that you don't want to mess with, and he wants Kei to join him and his group, who he claims are trying to live a peaceful life. Kei wants to know their secret and how they get by as people with normal lives. And lucky for Kei, Sato mentions that his sister is also safe and back at the hospital. But something is not right, as Kei senses something is nearby. We finally found some Ajins, which is good, but we can't trust them just yet, especially after what they did to our sister. Desperate times, I'm sure, but why would they kidnap someone close to us just to get our attention into meeting them, unless they directly want something from us? And this right here is a red flag. And despite what Sato told us about wanting to live peacefully, <laughs> bullcrap, we don't have much choice right now other than to keep an eye on them and to not trust them fully just yet, even if they're technically rescuing us. Let's stay sharp. All of a sudden, and a blow dart zips past them. It's the police, and all three agents take cover. However, K is shot in the chest and then quickly passes out. But then, as K's sleeping body lays there, Sato and Mr. Douchebag smile. There weren't any cops nearby, and it turns out that it was Mr. Douchebag's black ghost who shot K. The only way to learn how savage humans really are is by going through the most horrifying experience that K will ever know. And this is Sato's plan. K wakes up bound to a table, and his entire body is covered in bandages and restraints. This is truly horrifying. K can barely make out the sharp tools and knives circling around the room. K notices that this is an operating theater, and he's the star of the show. These surgeons are definitely not board certified, as K screams in horror as he dies over and over and over again from blood loss, organ failure, shock, and more, as he continues to relive the very worst day of his life, hating every last human around him. And this was all part of Sato's plan. Ten days later, Sato and Mr. Douchebag show up like knights in freaking armor, busting in and running around like he had a part in the Matrix trilogy, proving past all the guards and security that this lab throws at him. The guards don't realize that all of them are about to die as Sato is unstoppable. After the horrifying bloodbath and piles of bodies right outside, Sato pops into Kay's room and frees him, lying to his face about how he found them, and they set off to escape. But what Sato does doesn't realize is that this kid will cost him everything that he has planned soon enough. On the way out, they come across a few terrified surgeons as Sato tries to kill them but is stopped by Kei as he accidentally kills Sato in the process.
process. Okay, we just screwed up in a big way. From the way Sato killed that doctor for no reason makes me pretty darn sure that he'll be very happy to kill me if I don't comply with his orders. And just because we're a Jin, I would have used this time to grab his assault rifle and kill him repeatedly every few seconds, while ordering the doctors next to me to grab any scalpels or equipment that they have to use on Sato. We may not know how to kill him, but we sure as hell can slow down his healing process by ordering the doctors to cut off his hands and legs completely, and if they refuse, I'll do it myself. And then we're gonna make a run for it, and I think this is doable, because they just saw what happened, they know we're immortal, and we have a gun. K shouldn't have just sat there like an idiot, and he especially should have run away from the exit door as Sato was regenerating. He just made things a lot more difficult. Oh, I'm so annoyed. Sato regenerated and now wholly pissed off. He sets off through the room looking for Kei and the rest of the surgeons as he plans to kill everybody and now considers Kei a failure. Sato says since Ajins can't die, he's got other plans for Kei. If you chop off an Ajins head, will the head that grows back in its place be the same person? Or will Kei's consciousness remain in the chopped off head? This is what Sato plans to find out and this terrifies Kei who is running out of time. One of the doctors with him is not an asshole and says that he can show Kei the way out of the building if he helps them. And that's what Kei tries to do. He tries to outsmart Sato with a crude plan, but Sato's too dang old and smart and he beats up Kei, but also accidentally lets the two doctors escape. Kei is about to die as Sato towers over him, but that's when suddenly Kei's black ghost comes out to defend Kei and kill Sato, letting Kei barely escape with his precious young life and no goody for him. And thanks to that nice young doctor from earlier, K follows the lines drawn on the walls for him to follow, leading him onto the roof. However, as they make it near the edge of the building, the doctor is shot by Sato, and this looks like the end as Sato corners him. But K is able to bring out his black ghost once again to defend himself. This stuns Sato, as a Jin shouldn't be able to bring out their black ghost more than one or two times per day. And that's when Seto lets out his terrifying black ghost, and these two monsters battle it out to the death, throwing floating jabs and stinging slashes at one another. The two black ghosts duke it out as this gives K enough time to throw the injured doctor off the roof towards safety and K jumps down into the passing river. This doctor is a sweetheart so let's use him as a distraction and get away from Sato. K did mostly everything right except for a few things. Now I couldn't tell you high up exactly we are on the building but I'm pretty darn sure we're at least higher than four stories which would be 48 feet. This height is the medium lethal distance according to the book Trauma Anesthesia. That gives us at least a 50% chance of death from falling from such a height. And if anything, I think we're around 7 stories or higher, which gives us a 90% chance of death. This means that I would have used these odds to distract Sato with my angel doctor as he dies before releasing my black ghost on him, which meant I could have gotten up fully healed in seconds before jumping into the river nearby from a much safer height. Watching Kay's escape unfold on the security cameras, white haired guy gets a call from his boss and says that his job is now at stake and unless he wants to lose it, he better stop letting a Jin's escape left and right. White haired guy also finds out that the world is conducting inhumane experiments on Ajins for medical purposes and that Ajins have many uses for society, from making drugs to body armor, weaponry, and much more. This makes white haired guy furious and he decides to take matters into his own hands and kidnaps the big shot Ajin expert at gunpoint. Meanwhile, Sato and Mr. Douchebag go to the front of the lab, which is surrounded by news cameras and tells the reporters that he's planning a government protest rally in a few days for Ajins, a peaceful protest. Protests. He also releases a secret video to the whole world showing that the government inhumanely tortures a Jins. This shocks the world and everyone falls for what Sato says, not knowing that believing him will result in many innocent deaths soon enough. A few days later, the protest takes place at the ministry. However, not many people are there, including Sato, although his black ghost is there. And so are a bunch of other scary looking black ghosts invisible to the public. Here, Sato's ghost then tells them the location of the real Ajin meeting. At the real meeting, all the Ajins in Japan have gathered, falling for Sato's master plan to come out of hiding, to hear what plans he has for their kind. And that was their biggest mistake. Hold on, has anyone else thought that maybe this guy is a complete nut job? No one knows that we are Ajins, which means we could have held the meeting at least somewhere, oh, I don't know, more private? Even if our kind is wanted by the police, it's a little weird that Sato felt the need to hold a meeting in an abandoned warehouse. Going to an unknown place away from any sort of public eye is always a risky situation.
situation. And the fact that Sato invited us here means that he is holding all the cards. And in theory, if something goes wrong, then what's to stop Sato from kidnapping us right here? No one's around here to help us. Who knows what this dirty old man will do to us if we don't like his plans? He's an Ajin after all, which means we can't trust anyone around here we see except ourselves. Elsewhere, white haired man sits with the kidnapped Ajin researcher and interrogates him, asking him everything there is to know about Ajins. We find out this is personal for him, as he wants to know how to use their abilities for his own gain, helping his wife somehow wake up from her coma. Here we learn all the various things that makes Ajins unique, how each black ghost is different from the other, how rain makes it harder for Ajins to control their black ghosts, and that they have no cerebral limit, and that Ajins communicate to black ghosts via special electromagnetic waves that they give off. White haired guy listens to every last word that this guy says, as he prepares for the wrath and hellstorm that Sato will bring upon Japan very soon. As every day they waste is another day that the Ajins have to mobilize their armies as they prepare to eventually kill every single human in the world. Later on, Kei washes up on some random shore far away from Tokyo, but then on his way into the forest, he bumps into an old lady. Not wanting to seem suspicious by running away, he helps the old lady back to her house and plays it cool. Okay, this old grandma is suspicious and a problem, but Kei did good by not raising any suspicions. What we should do next is to head back to her house and lay the old lady down on her chair or bed for a nap and gently and tenderly choke her to death. Violent and cruelty to the old people, yes, I know. But hey, this will allow us to use her house as a means of a temporary shelter. We have no idea of where we are as of yet, so you know what? Question her on everything there is to know about this area and its people, and maybe her ATM details, before killing her. Now, the good thing is that Kei should have realized when he was being tortured that a Jin can regenerate their own vitamins and minerals, coming back to life good as new post-death. This means in theory that we don't need food or water to survive. Back at the Ajin meeting, Sato reveals his diabolical plans. He's going to use the citizens to make them hate the government, and then by using that very same hate as a means of traction to commit terrorist attacks all over the world, starting with one pharmaceutical company in central Tokyo that he plans to blow up. This company is known for conducting experiments on a Ajin. He even records and declares to the world that he will destroy the pharmaceutical company in a few days, and that this is only the start of his reign of terror. Okay, this is insane. We need to get out of here, and not only is this old man nuts, he is out on a quest for vengeance that will do nothing but stir up more shit. The problem that I have with this plan is that anytime one group decides to take matters into their own hands, the responsibility of making a good impression towards others will rely mainly on that group's ability of showing themselves in a positive light. Deciding to massacre groups of people throughout Japan will do nothing but rally the humans against us even more so. So bad plan. And that is giving what the government wants, making a Ajin seem even more deadly than they are. I'm willing to bet there's a lot of undiscovered Ajins out there, but I know that there are way more humans out there than Ajins, and if they all want us to die, then we will be beyond outnumbered, which is why we need to leave now. Not everyone at the meeting is as evil as Sato, claiming that doing this will make the world hate Ajins instead, but Sato is too much of a tyrant to listen, and orders Mr. Douchebag to put the disagreeing Ajins to bed. However, this red-haired dude escapes before he gets captured and takes the first train out of Crazy Town. Back at this old lady's house, Kay nervously checks out the place, knowing that he cannot let her find out who he is, and that at any moment the government could show up to kill him. He can't afford to relax. But turns out that this old lady reveals to Kay that she knows who he is, because she saw him on the news, but that Kay reminds her of her own grandson. So lucky for him, he can stay at her house for as long as he wants. Later on, red-haired kid reaches back to his apartment apartment all covered in his own blood from earlier. But this lady thinks he's already dead, as she tries to call him an ambulance. And to top it off, the government already knows who he is, thanks to his picture being identified at the protest rally earlier. This kid's in trouble. Red-haired kid makes a dash for it, knowing that if he is caught, he will never see the light of day again, and will forever be tortured to death over and over again. He then jumps for it and lands badly, injuring himself, just as he crosses path with white-haired guy and his assistant. White-haired guy then runs him over, about to capture him until the ambulance arrives, picking up and in fact rescuing red-haired kid from the government's clutches. He later sneakily escapes from the ambulance by playing dead. Well my oh my, this kid could not have been luckier, and it's a good thing that that helpful neighbor of his was shocked enough to call the ambulance, but I suspect we could have done this a little better. Red-haired kid chose the wrong day to wear yellow pants, that's for sure, moron. But honestly, he did the best that he could have done without taking off his shirt. It's highly unusual to go shirtless in Japan unless you're at the pool or beach, and this ain't no American college.
college campus. So really, red-haired kid would have dragged more attention coming back without wearing anything at all. But he didn't have to delay the inevitable of dying a slow death at the very end of his chase. It's clear that the people after him were no average gangsters, and that the government has now caught on to our real Ajin identity. So I would have wasted no time thinking we could have talked this out. I do want to note that red-haired kid is on the seventh floor. Red-haired kid could have simply jumped down as soon as he smelled a whiff of trouble. One, this gives you a great way to get to the ground level real fast. And two, he would not have been injured when white-haired man found him and could have ran away in full control of the situation rather than being rescued by the ambulance. Later on near grandma's place, K in his peaceful environment works on finding out everything there is to know about his powers, conducting his very own experiments on his Ajin and seeing just what in the hell he can truly do. And that's when he hears some ruffling in the bushes. Red-haired kid pops out from hiding as K kills him first before realizing that he's another friendly Ajin. However, K doesn't trust him and poisons him before beating the Ajin out of him and capturing him. No one can know where K is. This was incredibly smart and well done on K's part. Bravo. Even if this kid has good intentions, we don't know if he's being followed. And chances are anyone who traveled this far out of Tokyo is going to be in some sort of trouble. This is the very same kind of trouble that we want to avoid. What I would do next is to tie him up and hide him and keep my head low for the next few days for good measure. If anyone did follow him, then it's either the government, pairs of dangerous thugs, or other agents I don't know or care. I just don't want to be found. K explains to trapped red-haired guy that he's living in peace right now and has no interest in stopping Sato or fighting anyone. This angers red-haired kid as he knows what's at stake if K doesn't listen to him. That the city of Tokyo will be the first to fall, with thousands dead if no one stops Sato from destroying Japan. Meanwhile, Sato is already well underway, planning his greatest terrorist attack yet, getting supplies and help from all the other agents who plan to rain terror on the country of Japan within a few days. Sato's crew then dresses up as regular old workers heads to the headquarters of the pharmaceutical company, slipping past security and planting bombs all around inside, setting up the most terrifying terrorist attack in the history of Japan. The day of the bombing comes, and the government is on high alert, and has even placed extra security around the pharmaceutical building, and they've even implemented special measures thanks to what white-haired dude found out from the Ajin expert, as they release a surrounding wall of water droplets from numerous pipes all around the building. But it's already too late, and now thousands will die. Sato arrives, killing guards and receptionists as he heads to the top of the building just in time for the grand show. But Sato isn't at the pharmaceutical building. Turns out he's at the building next door. An eruption then goes off and a massive, terrifying explosion swallows the entire building whole. And Sato rides the collapsing building down as it crashes on top of the pharmaceutical building. As everyone in both buildings, thousands of innocent people die in a matter of seconds. It's a bloodbath and smoke covers the entire area as Sato wakes up and with a special shotgun package, preparing to take on what's to come, an elite unit from the Metropolitan Special Assault Team. Sato, live streaming this battle, prepares to show the world who is better, the best of the best of humans, or an Ajin. And this is one battle that neither of them can afford to lose. Gunshots go off as Sato is killed on sight, and the assault team begins to prepare to carry him out on a stretcher, continuously shooting him every three seconds to prevent him from coming back to life. But this was all part of Sato's plan. Okay, now while these dudes seemingly have have control of this Ajin down pat. Their coordination and timing is impeccable. Baby claps for them. I, uh, however, can't help but wonder as to why they didn't think to try other methods other than the simplest ones to keep him down. It's noted that Ajins begin to regenerate at their exact time of death, and what Japan's finest decided to do while simplistic seemed almost too tedious and risky. I would have suggested maiming Sato without killing him, such as conducting a very small neurosurgical operation on the spot by severing the connection in the brain's prefrontal cortex, or some other more extreme yet precise method to make Sato's brain dead or unable to function without killing him. Like K being injured time and time again, and a Jin doesn't regenerate until they are dead. Which means if we are able to prevent them from dying whilst keeping them incapacitated, it's safe to say that this method would be more viable and long-lasting than simply shooting him every three seconds as they carry him out on a stretcher. Because the moment he dies, we're on the clock before he comes back from the dead to try and kill us, and that's a risk I don't want to take. Suddenly, the assault team begins to get shot from a distance as the best of the best get killed on the spot by a sniper. Turns out that Sato arranged for two of his Ajin henchmen to cover him from the rooftops. The assault team panics as they try their very best to prevent Sato from waking up as they try to continue to move him towards a special vehicle parked in the distance, as they have their very own sniper team who try and take out the two Ajin snipers. But that's when these two crafty Ajins call in Mr. Douchebag as he, using his black ghost, terrifyingly kills all the rooftop snipers to lose focus as Sato finally breaks free. And that's
that's when all hell breaks loose. Sato wakes up and uses his shotgun to kill every single soldier around. Blood spills everywhere, as no one can seem to stop this agenda. He finally finishes killing the last person before he calmly walks away, showing the government and the world just how terrifying he truly is. Meanwhile, Kei, as he helps out Grandma, notices that none of the other villagers are out and about, and his senses tells him that something terrifying is coming, and that's when he suddenly gets shot. It's the police, as the finest of Japan's law force surrounds him, forcing him to bid fake Grandma farewell, and takes off into the forest. K, tricking the cops, darts in the opposite direction, going to where red-haired dude still is trapped, and releases him. Times have changed, and K is now ready to stop Sato for good, teaming up with red-haired dude. The two boys then head off, but cross paths with more Japanese police, and even white-haired dude himself. K is shot by a blow dart, and is about to pass out, but that's when he summons the terrifying black ghost, which acts independently as K passes out, shocking white-haired dude as his agenda assistant takes out her own black ghost as the two ghosts battle it out. As this happens, K and red-haired dude wake up and they make a break for it. K's black ghost gets destroyed, but amazingly, he just makes another one. As K continues to make more black ghosts, he stunned white-haired dude. The two boys then escape to take on Sato. Elsewhere across the country, we see Sato in a recording room, telling the world that this was only the beginning, and that the final wave of Ajins will come soon, to finally take over the entire country. And if you don't want an old Ajin man to take over your country, like, subscribe, comment, tell us what you like, what you didn't like, and check out the Harbi playlist down below. Peace!